So the last thing I want to talk about is a very specific problem in this phylogeny versus taxonomy problem. And that is the eukaryotic, prokaryotic um, kind of division of life. How many of you have seen one of these tables in a textbook sometime in your life? These are the worst thing ever. Seriously, they're really, really bad. For a variety of reasons. One of them is that they're typically they take when they when you talk about eukaryotes, you're not really talking about eukaryotes in general. You're talking about plants and animals. And for prokaryotes, you're not really talking about prokaryotes in general. You're talking about E. coli. And there's a lot of differences between E. coli and Homo sapiens, and so you can list them here. But that doesn't mean, just because something is true in E. coli, doesn't mean it's true in Bacillus subtilis or Chloroflexus or Rathiacus or Thermotoga maritima or any other of a wide variety of bacteria. And it certainly isn't likely to be true in archaea. And just because something is true in plants and animals doesn't mean it's true in all the other kinds of eukaryotes that are out there. The other thing is that this tends to be an exclusionary list. A lot of times what these lists are are a bunch of things that are found in eukaryotes and not in bacteria. And so this has some process or structure, and then this is doesn't have that, doesn't have that, doesn't have that. And so this doesn't tell you what an organism is. It tells you what it isn't. The last reason why this thing is terrible is because these are all wrong, at least in detail. And so, for example, eukaryotes are large, prokaryotes are small. Come on. Um, the reality is something like 30% of the sub, you know, less than 10 micron size organisms in the ocean are eukaryotes. You look at them under a microscope, you think they were bacteria, but they're not, they're eukaryotes. Likewise, there are lots and lots of bacteria that are large. I showed you one yesterday, a beautiful Piscium pitchosonium. Eukaryotes have a nucleus, and prokaryotes don't. How many of you have had metabolic regulation class? Yeah, so you know that's false, right? They don't have a nucleus with a nuclear membrane, but they certainly have a region where all the nuclear stuff happens. And has, it goes through the same kind of processes that, that uh, uh, the nucleus of a eukaryote does. Eukaryotes have lots of linear chromosomes. Prokaryotes have a small circular DNA. Totally false. Now, it's true that a lot of bacteria do have a single circular DNA, and, and some eukaryotes do have lots of linear chromosomes. But some of them have circular chromosomes. Some bacteria have linear chromosomes. The spirochetes in particular, linear chromosomes are common. Likewise, the firmicutes, excuse me, the actinobacteria. It's quite common for bacteria to have multiple chromosomes. We call them plasmids usually, but they're chromosomes. Um, and it's quite common for eukaryotes to have few and small chromosomes as well. Organelles, give me a break. Diploid, haploid, this is totally false. Many, many, many um, what people call protists and, and fungi are, are haploid rather than diploid. Sometimes they're in part of the life cycle, sometimes most of them. I don't even know what haploid means in a bacterium. My, mitosis. Again, think back to microbial metabolic regulation. That DNA in an E. coli cell adds up to a millimeter long in a one micron package. It's got to be organized. And when it divides, there has to be a complicated process for segregating those two chromosomes into the two ends of a cell. It sounds a lot like mitosis, doesn't it? Um, reproductive sex, or sexual reproduction and no reproductive, or no sexual reproduction. Well, you know that, organ, that microbes exchange DNA, and you also know, I hope, that, that most eukaryotes don't do it very often. This is, this is an idiosyncrasy of plants, animals, and some fungi. Cytoskeleton, give me a break. Cytos the bacteria have every bit as complicated as cytoskeleton as eukaryotes do. Ingestive, you know, ingestive or photosynthetic, well, both of those actually come from the symbionts they harbor, which are bacteria, right? Oxidative, living using air is the function of the mitochondria, not the eukaryote. Likewise, photosynthesis. Multicellular and unicellular, well, most Eukaryotes are unicellular, right? Um, and bacteria, although they don't form, you know, big lumbering creatures that walk around with cell phones, um, they certainly do function in, in, in populations. 
sometimes very simply, sometimes in very complicated ways, and we'll talk about that later on. Complex life cycles, that's false. Here's, here, you start to get some molecular biology here. Um, eukaryotes have poly A tails on their messenger RNA, and bacteria don't. Guess where poly A polymerase was discovered? E. coli. Bacteria do poly A down their messenger RNA. The function's a little bit different. It actually has almost the inverse property. Poly A tails are used to shorten the half life of messenger RNA, not lengthen like them. And they're short, they're not real long. Genes are transcribed separately. Did you know C. elegans, the worm, typically has polycystronic messenger RNAs? Usually in parrots. Bacteria have operons. Sure they do, some of them. And, and, and some organisms, like E. coli, have very organized operons. But many, many bacteria have disorganized operons. Introns. Guess where introns were invented? In bacteria. Why do eukaryotes have introns? They came from mitochondria and chloroplasts. Look at yeast. Yeast has 52 introns in the nucleus. They're all quite short. The mitochondria are full of big introns. Type 1, type 2 introns, cell splicing introns, all kinds of that kind of thing. Archaea often have lots of introns in their genomes, for example. Bacteria is rare, but they do exist in small numbers in certain organisms. Cyan or cyanobacteria have introns pretty prominently. And most eukaryotes don't have very many introns in them. The, the kind of intron-rich genomes that you think about in eukaryotes, where splicing is everywhere, that's specific to plants and animals, not to eukaryotes in general. Histones. Yeah, bacteria have histones too. They don't call them histones, but that's what they are. Again, you've got a big, long length of DNA. You have to package it. It's got to be organized. It can't just be a pile of noodles in the middle of the cell. So all of this is false. There's a worse issue going on here, though, and that's this word prokaryotes. What does that word mean? Not a eukaryote. It doesn't tell you what an organism is. It tells you what it isn't. Now, until you can do this molecular biology, people thought of things as eukaryotes or prokaryotes because they didn't have any way of looking at those prokaryotes and seeing if they were related to each other. But the assumption was that they were. Turns out that assumption was false, right? It turns out that there are two kinds of prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea. And those two, organisms, two groups of organisms are not related to each other any more than all living things are related to each other. And in fact, archaea are more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. So when you, say, when you use the word prokaryotes, I want you to always put it in quotes because it is a bad biological term. It's like the term invertebrates. What does invertebrate tell you about an animal? It tells you what it isn't, right? It doesn't tell you what it is. I, hear, I have a couple of aquariums, and, and you hear people at, at aquarium shops talk all about how such and such a process or, or solution is good for invertebrates. What kind of invertebrates? It doesn't mean anything. All that means is that it's not good for fish, usually. The last thing is, and I'm going to get back to the superiority inferiority thing here, which, which bugs me. A lot of what's going on in this table is a lame attempt to inflate the egos of these things and to show that they're better than these things. I mean, take a look at that list and tell me I'm wrong. These things are supposed to be superior and these things are supposed to be inferior. And, and again, from a scientific perspective, I, I don't see any meaning in that. All right, so we're done. Next time we get into the meat of it and we'll start to talk about how these phylogenetic trees and relationships are, are sorted out. We'll spend a couple of weeks on that and, and talking about trees in general. Curiosity.